On today's Monday Night Travel, Rick Steves regales us with a trip report from his recent adventures in Morocco. Among other stunning cities, we'll visit the capital of Rabat with its iconic Kasbah. We'll also get a glimpse of the maze-like marketplaces in Marrakesh's Medina. And no trip to Morocco would be complete without an exploration of the Sahara-bordering Atlas Mountains. Thanks for joining us as we experience the majesty of Northwest Africa. Good evening and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. I'm Lisa Friend and I'm delighted to be your moderator this evening as we meander our way to Morocco. Now please, put your travel dreams in the upright and locked position as I have the pleasure to introduce our host for the evening, Rick Steves. Welcome, Rick. Lisa, thank you so much and welcome everybody to Monday Night Travel. And I am just raring to share my adventures on my fall vacation. I just got back just a week or 10 days ago from Morocco. And, you know, I've been traveling a lot and my family stopped paying attention to all my slideshows when I got home a long time ago. So for me, this is just a joy to have an audience that would love to see what I did on my vacation. And it was just a, an amazing experience. Spent 10 days in Morocco um, and uh, just, just had a blast. So thank you for joining us. I've got, um, I've got uh, our friend Lucas Peters, who's written the book on Morocco. You've seen him on Monday Night Travel. He's actually answering uh, questions along with Ben during the next hour. So if you've got any questions about Morocco, you got the guy who wrote the book right there helping you out. I'm going to share what I did thanks to a tour that Lucas put together. And um, I came home with some very nice souvenirs. I love little tea glasses. And these are my Moroccan tea glasses, and I love mint tea. So, uh, for the sake of a of a TV prop, I've got a bigger glass here, and this is my mint tea. I love mint tea. It's black tea, and then it is, of course, with the local mint in there, and it gives it a very lovely extra flavor. And in Morocco, you have to have a lot of sugar in your tea. This is chipped because it had traveled rough with my beautiful, wonderful daughter who spent a month in the Atlas Mountains of Morocco when she was in high school. And she brought this tea or this sugar um, um, cup home for me. And I'm going to just put a lot of sugar into my tea because that I find gains the respect of your Moroccan friends. And you mix that up and then you got a nice, sweet minty glass of tea to celebrate Morocco. Mm. A, a local drink takes you right back. And I'm so thankful for my daughter's experience traveling in Morocco. It opened up perspective in a wonderful way. Okay, so thanks for joining us. I'm going to take you to Morocco right now. Uh, thanks to Monday night travel. So we're going to start. Well, we're going to start in the big capital city of Rabat. And uh, when we think of the best 10 days in Morocco, first of all, I would say most people go to Tangier up in the north because it's just an hour or so away from Spain on a fast boat. And that's what I do because it's a chapter in my Spain book is head down to Tangier. It's a great place. Um, we're not going to cover it tonight because we're going to follow what I did on my 10 day vacation. And uh, you can see by the map that we flew into Casablanca. That's the big city that is of very little interest to a tourist. We went from Casablanca straight to the capital city of Rabat. And then if you look at the red line tra tracking all around Morocco, remember Morocco is the size of California and it's got, um, it's got about uh, 40 million people in it. Uh, we spent uh, over 10 days, probably 24 hours on the bus to drive a thousand miles that you see this red dotted line, okay? So from the airport at Casablanca, we went straight to Rabat where we spent our first night. Uh, and then we headed out to Meknes. And on the way we visited the most, um, the most holy city in the country, Mule Idris, and the most famous Roman ruins, Bulabolis. And then after some beautiful time in Meknes, we went to Fez and the two big tourist cities and the two big historic wonderful cities to see in Morocco are Fez and Marrakesh. So we spent half of our time in those two cities. From Fez, we drove about a long way, six or seven hours one day, all the way to Erfud, over the mountains, the Atlas Mountains. Morocco is divided by the Atlas Mountains. It's Mediterranean European style Morocco, or it is Saharan Morocco, south of the Atlas Mountains. And we really wanted to get south of the Atlas Mountain. That's where a lot of the magic is. 
and we went from Erfurt across to Zagora and then into the desert a bit and then up north over the mountains about 6,000 feet and down into Marrakesh where we side tripped up into the Tobkai National Park. And that's uh, sadly where the uh, epicenter of the earthquake was just last uh, this last year. And we visited that, had some beautiful days hiking, and then back to Marrakesh. And from there, we flew home. So that is what we're going to do together. It's an enchanting land, Morocco. And uh, I uh, teamed up with my girlfriend, Shelly, and uh, we just had a wonderful vacation and a good chance to Good for me because I don't make TV shows, I don't make guidebooks, and we don't do tours in Morocco. So I didn't have any distractions, no work, just enjoying traveling with a good travel partner. And we decided to team up with Simon. You may have seen him because he's the mysterious, silent, bearded man that always eats with me on my TV shows. He's our producer. I've spent more time in Europe with Simon than anybody else in my life. 700 days I've been in Europe with Simon because he's with me every minute when we're making TV shows for the last 30 years. But Simon and I have never been on vacation together in Europe. <laughs> so I thought, what a concept. Simon and I will go to Europe without a TV crew and just have a good time. And we'll bring, bring our, our favorite travel partners. I had Shelly and he had his wife, Val, and we just had a delightful time together. Uh, we had a chance to go on our own and there's a lot of people going on their own and, and that can be a challenge and that can be rewarding. But we decided to, uh, I've got, I'm friends with Lucas who writes the Moon Guide to Morocco and Lucas runs a company called Journey Beyond Travel and Lucas makes bespoke tours. And uh, uh, we just uh, teamed up together. Uh, we had a car, we had a driver, we had delightful, luxurious hotels. Everything was figured out, all sorts of experiences. And if you're thinking about how much a trip would cost, uh, we went sort of high end on Lucas's bespoke tours with our own driver and our own car. And it's about $500 a day per person. Um, uh, you could do it less expensive if you put eight people in a vehicle, or you could do it less expensive if you chose cheaper hotels and, and less fancy experiences. But we wanted to pull out all the stops. So just so you know how much it cost, figure 500 bucks a day per person if you have four people to share the vehicle. We stayed in Rabat on our first night, and right away we realized there's five cities called the Imperial Cities in Morocco. And they're Imperial Cities because they have a, a rich heritage with the king and lots of royal palaces and fortresses and so on. Today's king is Mohammed the sixth, and he is a pro relatively progressive king. His, um, the king before him, his, the, the wife was never even seen in public. Nobody really even knew who she was or what she looked like. Uh, there, you know, there's a lot of history and a lot of conservativeness and a lot of tradition in Morocco. And there's a lot of change in Morocco in this last generation. Mohammed VI is a good king uh, as far as kings can go. And we asked people a lot, you know, well, you've got a king. It's not really democracy. He, he doesn't have to listen to the voters. Uh, what about that? And they say, well, we would prefer to have a king than to be like Syria and try to throw away our king. Syria, of course, is a is a, a horrible nightmare because they tried to get rid of their king in the name of democracy. So there's some realities in the developing world. And for a lot of Americans, we don't realize that for many people, stability is the main uh, desire. They just want stability. Democracy would be great also, but if you don't have stability, you can't really have democracy. And what Morocco has is stability, as you'll see in this slideshow. There's so many royal palaces. Every great city has a royal palace, and we got to visit the gardens and the, and, and the grounds of these royal palaces. I've always liked the stop sign in Morocco in Arabic. Uh, it just looks like a, a toboggan sign. It says, like, no tobogganing? No, that's just stop in Arabic. The um, royal, um, the, it's the capital of the country, and you'll have the mausoleum for the last king. And this is the mausoleum for Mohammed V. And when you step inside this, it's just a, a you can tell it's a very, very important place for the Moroccans. And it's uh, other uh, royalty is buried in the same mausoleum. Out front is a, a mosque called the Unfinished Mosque. And there's our guide, Redwan, and uh, he would, um, you know, drive us organize all of our events and also give us information as we traveled. That first night, we just wanted a little bit of welcome to Morocco. So we went to the wonderful castle on the bluff overlooking the coast. Rabat was the only time we saw the Atlantic Ocean on our trip. And there's a wonderful promenade right along the coast that was a delight. And then I just really wanted to reconnect with Morocco. Uh, at night, it's just a delight. We were there just two weeks ago. So well, that's um, 
end of September, early November. Beautiful time. Every day was just comfortable weather in the 70s, generally, and sunny. Um, and each night was balmy. So we went out, as you can see, people dressed here. It's quite comfortable and uh, just strolling around. And for me, that's the big, great joy of Morocco is to uh, just, um, you know, uh, connect with people and sample little goodies and find little moments. Uh, uh, this is our guide and our driver, Redwan, and we all packed into that vehicle and we hit the road the next morning. Uh, it was comfortable for four of us. Remember, anytime you're traveling, if you put four people in a vehicle, it's much more affordable than two people or one person. So the more you pack into the vehicle, the better. And this was a, you know, private tour. Uh, it was four people in a car with a driver. Uh, our first stop was Moulay Idris. And this is, in a lot of ways, it's the holiest city in Morocco. If I understand it correctly, over a thousand years ago, this is where Islam and uh, the Arab population came to Morocco. The indigenous people are Berber people. In comes the Arabs and their new religion. Muhammad was from the seventh century and his religion spread like wildfire right across Africa and right across Asia. And, um, and, and that really, when that uh, Arabic Muslim uh, royalty married into the Berber royalty here um, over a thousand years ago, in a lot of ways, that's the beginning of Morocco. Uh, Vula Belis is a beautiful city. We all just were enchanted by, uh, not Vula Belis, that's the Roman Rones nearby, but Moulay Idris. And we hiked through the town and uh, it was just lively and, and fun. And we got to the very top of the town and there's an English expat named Mike. And he's got uh, a little boutique gourmet restaurant called the Scorpion House. And Lucas with his Journey Beyond Travel Company has connections with a lot of um, expats, English speaking expats, mostly English people. And uh, they just really know what tourists are interested in. And that's like safe and beautiful, uh, distinctly Moroccan cuisine. Most of these expats are married into Moroccan society, as Lucas is. Lucas's wife, Amina, is from Tangier, and she's a partner in his business with him. But imagine this perch in this wonderful Welcome to Morocco first meal. And then we went down below the holy city of Moulay Idris, and we went to the enchanting Roman ruins of Vula Bolis. I was here when I was a teenager on my first backpacking trip through Europe, and I was just so struck by how remote this amazing Roman city was. In its day, 20,000 people. It was a trading crossroads back when it was one of the most remote cities in the Roman Empire. And today, today you can you can lose yourself in these ruins. And there's always local guides standing by where for 20 or $30, you can have a guide show you around. And that brings that rubble to life. I'll promise you that. Well, our destination that way was to get to Fez. Fez is the spiritual capital of Morocco. And every city in, every major city in Morocco has um, uh, a historic Arabic quarter within a wall and that would be called the Medina. And then just outside of the wall, you've got the modern French or European city, a grid plan town with all sorts of, lots of art deco architecture and so on. And um, Fez is just like enchanting. It's, it's the most tangled and labyrinthine Medina I've been to. I think it's, you could call it the most, the best preserved historic town, perhaps in the, in the Muslim world. Um, and we couldn't get our car into the Medina, obviously. So you would have a porter waiting for you. And he's got his big wheelbarrow there. We piled our luggage into the wheelbarrow and he walked us through the Medina to get to our um, Riyadh, our traditional hotel. And when we got to this Riyadh, you'll hear this word Riyadh, R-I-A-D. And that's an old mansion, basically, surrounded by a tangled Medina. And everything is kind of fortified and blocked off on the outside. And you step inside and it's an inward looking palace. It has a beautiful rectangular courtyard with palm trees and gardens and fountains. And uh, they greet you with, uh, I'm gonna have another sip of my mint tea. Yeah. I'm there, I'm right back. I'm right back in Fez. Wow. Uh, so they greet you with tea and then you go to your room and then you realize this is quite luxurious. Uh, you're in this oasis of tranquility in the middle of this teeming Medina. And it's quite a nice base for a stop in a town like that. And any of these Riyads cater to um, their tourists with fine meals. And for me and Shelley and Simon and Val, 
we wanted to eat the local food, but we wanted to stay healthy. And you do have to be careful in Morocco. I would say you've got, I don't know, a 20 or 30 or 40 percent chance of getting uh, intestinal trouble while you're in Morocco. I mean, you go to Morocco and you eat the food, there's a good chance you're going to get sick. You're not going to have to go to the, you know, it's not going to debilitate you, but you're going to use up a little more toilet paper than you would otherwise. Let's just put it that way. Um, but look at this. Look at this luxury. We were eating safely because we were eating in our riads and we were eating in places that were designed to cater to the tummies of tourists. It's a big difference than eating in a restaurant that might not be tuned into the needs of a tourist. Well, the Medina is about, it's got about 100,000 people in it, and it is circled with a five mile long wall. Remember that wall was built a thousand years ago. I remember when I was there as a teenager, I could not keep track of where I was. And now, so many years later, I could not keep track of where I was. The only way to know where you are in the Medina is by altitude. If you wanna, you know, you can keep going uphill until you get to the blue gate and that's the exit to the giant medina or you can keep going downhill but it is hard to keep track of where you are in that medina i'll tell you that uh, this is the blue gate bab b-a-b i think is the word for gate and that's a key word when you're trying to navigate anywhere what gate are you looking for well we would say goodbye to our car and then we'd wander through the labyrinthine medina and we would be able to get to our Riyadh, and that was our base for exploring that amazing town now, you don't have a map where you can just say, okay, go two blocks this way and take a left. It's tangled. You can't keep track, but they do have a lot of signs. Ah, and these signs do their best to tell you where that restaurant is or where that hotel is or where that mosque is or where that uh, madrasa is or whatever. Uh, but that's just kind of part of the decoration is all the signs you'll see as you are lost in the Medina of whatever town you are in in Morocco. You know, you have the the, the thoroughfares that are very populated. And then you get off on a side street and you find most of them are little cul-de-sacs, little dead ends. There's actually a word, it's a derb, a D-E-R-B. And what I was fascinated by was that wall was made a thousand years ago, five miles around, but it didn't have a hundred thousand people back then. It had a couple of streets and it was fortified and people had their farm and their big property and their subsistence lifestyle, I guess. And then over time, that family or that clan with that plot of land got more densely populated. And eventually today, it's just dense populated. There's no open spaces hardly. And what was the gateway to that farmland was now the um, dead end lane that takes you in to that little neighborhood. So that former big vast farm is now a neighborhood and it has a derb, it's a cul-de-sac and you find yourself in a lot of derbs and you lose your track of your way, there are dead ends and you end up back on the main thoroughfare. I found a great use for my air tag. Uh, you know, I like to put an air tag in my bag so I know where it is. And um, on my phone, it just I just uh, check it out and oh, my bag's over there. And uh, your bag is at your hotel, hopefully. And if you wanna find your way, you just, see on your phone where is your bag and it leads you even in the most labyrinthine confusing medina it leads you back to your hotel so that's another use of a air tag which i think is quite handy wandering around the medina of fez you just see so many glorious schools and mosques madrasas and mosques and when it's called a prayer time five times a day People drop what they're doing and they go to the nearest mosque and they do their prayers. It's quite a beautiful, beautiful part of the culture. And each of those schools and mosques and public fountains is decorated not with images because, because the Islam sensibility is you don't have images of people or animals, but you have beautiful decoration and script instead. It's either mosaics or it's carved into the ceramics, but it really is quite an art form that I find just mesmerizingly beautiful as you explore the town. The, um, the vernacular architecture is just plain, mud brick and, and uh, stuccoed, but anything that's a big important building, a mosque or a school or a public fountain, it will be decorated. You can find so many artisans doing their work in Morocco. That's one of the great joys of traveling in Morocco. And we went to a couple of workshops where we got to see that. But the real joy in Morocco is just wandering around. I, I find the mannequins quite quite quirky and fascinating, actually. There's, you just can't f help but stumble onto weird, weird photographs of mannequins as you're going from shop to shop and just aimlessly wandering around. 
I'll tell you, there's a lot of shops and there's a lot of happy welcomes. Merhaba, merhaba, come on in, let's make a deal. And it's fun to shop. Uh, there's lots of shopping and lots of friendly people. One of the highlights is the tannery. Everybody wants to go to a tannery. And this is the medieval way of tanning leather. You've got all these circular vats. Some of them are for softening the leather and others are for dyeing the leather. And uh, it's a, quite a process. And when you walk in there, it's almost like a, it's like a hellish nightmare with all these hides that are just stacking up, waiting to be tanned or whatever. And uh, it's a muddy kind of smelly world. And you go in there and you have a mint leaf. Uh, mint is not just for your tea, but mint is to disguise the stench of the leather as it is being dried out and tanned. It's a teeming area with all sorts of people working on this industry. And after the leather has been softened and cleaned and dyed, it is then put out to dry and uh, the people work hard and they share a big dish of couscous for lunch. It's kind of fun to see people digging into their couscous. Uh, it's everywhere you look, there are cool sights when you're in Morocco. And I saw this guy outside of the tannery and he's walking around with 50 bucks on his head. You know, I, I just reminded myself, hey, that was a, that's where we get our word for dollar, a buck, uh, a buckskin uh, was a dollar. And uh, that's exactly what this is. It's almost like a currency. That's a lot of leather tanned beautifully, soft and ready to go to the craftspeople who are going to turn that into belts and bags and clothing and uh, all sorts of useful things. With our tour on Journey Beyond Travel, we were booked with lots of different co-ops and especially co-ops that were given women a chance to um, get ahead in their society where they've had so many disadvantages until now. Beautiful organizations designed to help women make a place in the workplace. And this was a, a co-op here. Uh, and it was a co-op that um, is uh, all about beautiful um, woven goods. And tourists can book a time and we settle down and they will then uh, let us make our own little carpet. And it was tedious and it was hard, but we were doing it. We all had our own designs. I was busy at work on mine. Shelly was busy at work on hers, but it was slow going. So we really, didn't get a chance to um, finish our carpets, but we did get a beautiful memory out of it. We got an appreciation of what it takes to make one of those carpets. And we made friends with the women who were working there. And uh, well, we had a chance to, <laughs> I'll, I'll show you, we had a chance to make a, a fun souvenir. This is my, this is my um, unfinished carpet. It was my aborted carpet project, and we turned it into a necklace. So I got my unfinished carpet necklace, and it's a nice little souvenir. And I can remember if I had four or five days, I could have made something big enough to be maybe a prayer rug. But right now, I've got a cool souvenir from my time in Morocco. So many fun ways to connect with that delightful culture. Everywhere you go, people feed you sweets. There's not dessert. They don't really have the concept of dessert, but they sure have the concept of cookies and sweet stuff when you want a snack. In the middle of that crazy Medina, you've got fancy, elegant, venerable old buildings that have been turned into um, tourist class restaurants and tour groups you'll see going around um, just sticking together and uh, going from one tourist joint to one demonstration to one workshop to the other. Uh, and there are historic buildings dotting that uh, uh, Medina. Um, for instance, there are historic um, synagogues. And uh, the, I didn't realize what a big part of Morocco's story was Jewish history. But the Jews were big in Spain until 1492, and then they got kicked out. A lot of them went up to Amsterdam, and a lot of them went down into Morocco from Spain, and they were welcomed in Morocco. And they stayed in Morocco. It was a big part of the Morocco population until Israel was created in, what, 1947. And then nearly all the Jews left Morocco for Israel. And today, a major percent of the uh, population of Israel is Jews from Morocco. Today, there's almost no Jews left in Morocco. These uh, synagogues are basically just sightseeing attractions and the Jewish heritage is gone. So you say, they will say, this is the Jewish quarter, but you'll say, where are the Jewish people? They are in Israel. 
You'll find uh, all the practicalities you need, ATMs and so on. Uh, people use your, take your credit cards, no problem at all. Uh, the highlight for me and Shelly was finally just to get on our own and get lost. That's a great thing in a Medina is just get lost, have fun, follow your sense of adventure, um, you know, and just wander. Don't try to stay found. You're just somewhere in that Medina until it's time to go and then you can somehow figure out how to get back. But just all sorts of beautiful moments, just delightful moments that you'll see being in the Medina. Tiny, tiny restaurants, one table restaurants are just so much fun. Murals, there, there was no political murals, just, just beautiful street art. I mean, here's a, street, a piece of street art that celebrates uh, Muslims, Christians, and Jews all getting along, which is kind of poignant when you consider what's going on in Gaza and Israel right now. By the way, we were in Israel during the horrible news of uh, Hamas and so on, and um, People were, were wondering, how's that going to impact my travels? It did not impact our travels at all. It was everybody is heartbroken at what's going on in Israel and, and Gaza right now. And people are heartbroken about that in, in Morocco. Of course, in our Christian society, we would be more closely allied with the Jewish uh, heartache. And in a Muslim society, they're more closely, they're more tuned into the Palestinian Muslim heartache. Uh, but it's heartache all around and just a tragedy. So fun to just get out and meet people. And especially when you get off the beaten path, you meet people that don't deal with tourists. And that was really fun, really, really fun. Um, for that evening, we got together with another one of these um, touristic sort of experiences. And we went to a place called Courtyard Kitchen and the chef was Tara Stevens. And we went up under her rooftop and man, oh man, did she serve us a nice dinner. Um, this would be kind of a gourmet thing to do. But uh, here's where you find, I think, the very best in fancy Moroccan cuisine. And what Tara is really specializing in, along with all those beautiful herbs and all those special local ingredients. I get hungry just looking at this. It's delightful how she would explain what we're eating as she brought out every course. But it was paired with good local wine. Now, in my experience, when you go to a, a Muslim country where most people aren't even allowed or, or don't even drink wine, it's not going to have great wine. But for, maybe it's the fact that France was the colonial overlord of uh, Morocco for a long time. The wine in Morocco is excellent. And not all restaurants serve wine. But if you want to have wine or beer at a restaurant, you just got to find out in advance. To, you got to choose a restaurant that does serve alcohol because it's, a, it's not in keeping with the traditional conservative culture. But the wine there, every time we had a bottle of wine, red wine, I was very impressed by it. And a bottle, we would go for the upper end bottles and it was 20 to $30 for a bottle and excellent. Simon's birthday, happy birthday, Simon. And then it was time to leave Fez. So we had our porter take our bags again and our driver would be waiting for us at the nearest place a car can be and we we're on our way. As you travel around Morocco, there's a lot of police stops. Uh, you know, it's this, it's the Islamic world is a little bit uptight and they've got a police presence and they're concerned about large crowds gathering and they just keep an eye on things, um, uh, which is fine with me as a traveler. Uh, the travel, the country felt very safe. Um, not a lot of traffic on the road, beautiful roads, beautiful scenes. We went over the mountain and down what's called the Ziz Valley. And uh, we came to famous towns, towns south of the Atlas Mountains that I went to as a teenager. Uh, Erfurt, uh, Kassar Souk, which is now called Eresidia, and Risani, uh, delightful places to check out. And this is the land of dates. Dates is a big part of the economy down here. And the palm trees were just rich with dates and everywhere you went, you're fed dates. Uh, we visited a, a, a family in a little village and the man of the house took us on a walk through the palm grove and we got to learn about the whole date industry. We had a very nice meal there in the shade of the palm trees. And then we just went to a town that had no tourism and I just enjoyed walking around. Our guide didn't take us here. We were just free to wander around, meet the kids, have some laughs, share some words and then go along on our way. We stayed in a town called uh, Erfurt, and uh, just, you know, before dinner or 
I think it was before dinner. We went down and there's not a lot to do in the town except just go check out the market and see what's on the main square. Got to the main square and for 10 dirham, that's $1, I could rent one of these fun cars. And just that, what an impromptu fun thing to do. So Shelly and I hopped on a car and we were always thinking about the tragedy in Gaza and in Israel. And why can't we just all live to learn, learn to live together? And we were on this uh, little car and the song was, It's a Small World. And we're listening to It's a Small World and all these beautiful kids, these beautiful Muslim kids, uh, Arabic and Berber and Moroccan, um, on their bikes. And this is not a rich country. This is just a hardworking middle country. And it's a stable country. The beauty of stability, you don't need to be rich and powerful like the United States to give your kids a good upbringing. And in Morocco, kids are having a great upbringing. And I, it just, I thought kids all across the world in war-torn countries could be having this kind of childhood. And it just, it's just a thoughtful one minute, it's a small world delight. <laughs> It's a small world after all. It's a small world after all. It's a small world after all. It's a small, world. small world. Hey, salam. Oh man, I think I'm going to put some more sugar in my mint tea here and remember those kind of moments that was a delight okay the next morning we drove on big distances remember this is a country the size of california and uh south of the atlas mountains you've got some pretty rough and tumble towns with no tourism at all yeah gonna put up with some bathroom facilities that might not be up to your standards. You're going to meet some very interesting people who find you very interesting. And you can see now where we've gone. We're about halfway through our loop. We started in Casablanca. We went straight to Rabat. Then we went to that Roman ruins at Bulabulis in the holy town of Mule Idris. After stopping uh, in Fez, which is the most historic city in the Arab world, I think with its Medina of 100,000 people in that five mile long wall over the mountains to Erfud. Now we're going along the Draw Valley. Um, and this valley is famous for its, it's famous for its dates. There's like 2 million date trees, they say there. And it's a big part of the industry. We're going to get to Zagora. And from there, we're going to head south into the Sahara Desert. So we're heading over to Zagora. Our driver, Red One, our beautiful car. I noticed when you get really off the beaten path, there's a lot of old tires that are used for decorative purposes. There's a lot of striking scenery. And then we got to the town of Zagora, and there we went to a historic medieval um, library. And it was fascinating to see these precious old manuscripts from centuries ago. And what struck me is you've got your Arabic script and you've got your Berber script. And uh, just like in the United States, we're uh, appreciating our Native American heritage. In Morocco, there's more respect for their Berber heritage. And this is the Berber script. And you'll find these days anywhere in Morocco, this is a museum in Tangier, you've got three scripts. You've got Arabic, you've got English, and you've got Berber. Not many people even read Berber script. Berber is not a written language. Uh, it's a spoken language. 
but out of respect to the Berber people, they're, they're trying very hard to make life um, good for the Berbers. And I think of all the re relations between dominant culture and indigenous culture, perhaps the most equitable is in Morocco between the Arab population and the indigenous Berber population. Uh, it's an interesting thing to learn about as you travel. Now, when you go to these mud brick villages, you see the evolution. First of all, you see the importance of rebar. When you have an earthquake, and they do have earthquakes there, if there's no rebar, you've got a catastrophe. But you got your rebar, things are going to hold up. So I love to see rebar. And then you see, used to see uh, rabbit ears. Then you had satellite dishes. And now you have cell towers on the top of the mountain. It's fascinating how the structure stays about the same, but the technology evolves over time. We were in a town outside of, uh, of Zagora called Tamagrut. And Tamagrut is famous for its green pottery and its traditional kilns. And uh, what a visit that was. And of course, there would be a shop there where they'd sell their stuff. And it was a beautiful place to get a souvenir that we'll always remember. It had been a drought in Morocco for several months. And the clouds were building and there was menacing clouds on the horizon, but everybody was excited because it was about to rain. And when the rain finally came, you know how you can smell the dust becoming almost ready for a rainstorm. Um, there was that smell all across the land and people were excited and energized and the rain was coming. And uh, we're, remember, we're down in the Sahara. The next stop is literally Timbuktu. It's 50 days by camel to get to Timbuktu. Uh, so we're way in the south. And suddenly, we were driving towards, we were going across the desert to get to our, we were going to sleep in tents uh, in the desert so we could wake up under a blanket of stars, so we could be on the top of the sand dune and, and glissade down, so we could ride a camel. We had, it was a highlight of our, of our trip, but uh, nature changed it. And what we saw in the distance was a storm and pretty soon we became engulfed in the storm and we had our two cars. These are four by fours. This is not Red One's car. We had our guides that were taking us into the desert. We we're going to sleep in the desert. And suddenly we had no visibility. We had to stop. And I, uh, I was happened to be rolling uh, <laughs> as this thing happened. But here is a one minute, what I call a one minute Sahara horror story. It's a horror story. That's what. Wow, I am blessed with a beautiful travel partner. <laughs> that was quite an experience to share. And uh, Shelly was just amazing. And uh, thankfully, we were not hurt. And uh, Simon and Val were not hurt. But our windows were blown out. <laughs> God, I've never experienced anything like it. And, we, uh, and I gained an appreciation for safety glass. I mean, Thank God for safety glass. If we had shards all over us, I don't know what would have happened. But safety glass breaks into just little crumble stuff. And um, it was these safety glass. If you hit safety glass with a screwdriver, if you just go pop with the screwdriver, I think it'll shatter. And um, these um, pebbles and sand coming at us like, like out of a machine gun were enough to pop the windows on our car. And it felt like we were in a, in a, in a, in a car wash, you know, when you drive your car through a car wash. And then suddenly it felt like we were in a car wash with the windows down or in a convertible. 
it was insanity for a couple of minutes. And it was that dark moment when you're huddled together and you wish you had something more to protect your, your head and you don't know what direction this is gonna go. And uh, I, I, it just was, it was pretty scary. But thankfully it passed and uh, all of our luggage was wet and we were wet uh, and we kind of collected the pieces and we called up Red Juan with our car that was 10 miles away and they had no storm there. And he picked us up and we had to rejigger our um, itinerary and uh, we traveled on, but we did not get to go, sadly, to the desert. So I had to take pictures of postcard racks. This is what we would have done, except for that stupid storm. And uh, it would have been quite nice. So I've got an excuse to go back to Morocco. Uh, we were going to sleep in tents in the desert. And they checked with our um, hosts down there. And the roads were destroyed. Or the, the tracks were messed up. So the cars could not safely go there. And the tents themselves were just blown, blown apart. So there was no place to sleep that night. So it was a tough day for, for our tour company. And it was a tough day for our drivers. And it was a tough day for us. Uh, and uh, the camels got the last laugh, I guess. So we went to the place we were going to go the next night. We went tonight, and it was a beautiful um, desert resort where we had a swimming pool, and uh, we just took a walk. And it was one of the highlights of our trip, just to get out and take a walk, just to walk through the neighborhood. And not a hint of any tourism, just a reminder that this world is such a beautiful place with so much love so much joy and if anybody doesn't think the world is filled with love and joy and beautiful people you got to get out a little more and when you get out you got to just get out there and see people raising their families and pursuing their dreams whatever religion whatever government it is fundamentally people and if we can just meet each other and get to know each other i think we could do all right uh, beautiful little schools wonderful opportunities and as everywhere the sad evidence of climate change. It's not a good time if you're a palm tree in an oasis valley, considering the drought that comes with climate change. And the palm trees are pretty sickly, just like the coral reefs, and just like so much else in this world of ours today. If you are a movie producer, you might want to go to Where's It's At? Oh, where's it's at is a great town. I've got great memories of that place when I was a kid traveling there. And today it's famous for uh, movies, movie studios. And uh, there's a town nearby which is famous for its castle. A castle is called a Kassar. And this is the Kassar of Ait Ben Hadou. And when you go to this place, you realize, whoa, what a great set for a movie. And that's where Gladiator was filmed, The Last Temptation of Christ. Uh, Lawrence of Arabia and one of my favorite movies, A Man Who Would, The Man Who Would Be King, all filmed right in and around this Kassar. Uh, lots of tourists there and a chance to wander through quite an amazing medieval town that survives to this day in its mud brick form with its castle on top of the bluff. From there, we wind up, up, up into the mountains, the high Atlas Mountains, and we come to the sort of the Continental divide in a lot of ways between Mediterranean Morocco and Saharan Morocco. Switchbacks to the top, and we get to the pullout at the very top, uh, which is the pass called Tichka. And the altitude, as you can see by the sign, 2,200 meters. That would you just triple that and you add about 10%. So that would be 7,000 feet. 7,000 feet. It was crisp. It was cool. There was lots of trinkets for sale. And then it's all downhill to Marrakesh. Marrakesh, what a city. I absolutely love Marrakesh. Marrakesh is, um, along with Fez, the big tourist attraction in Morocco. It has its huge Medina, an even bigger Medina, surrounded by a fortified wall. That's kind of the definition of Medina, with a couple of main arterials, and then all sorts of derbs, little cul-de-sacs, and all sorts of little winding lanes, and lots of commerce. Uh, you know, I've got these romantic memories of Morocco from years past, and I just was so thankful that even after decades of not going into the heart of Morocco, the magic of Morocco is still there. Shelley and I were just enjoying a, a, a little uh, snack and a little drink at a, pa a pastry shop, and I just took a video. It's uh, just a one-minute snap 
of what Morocco is like in the Medina. Check this out and you can see why so many people love Morocco. Hey, I'm Rick Steves, and I'm in a relatively touristy corner, deep in the heart of the Medina in Marrakesh, deep in the heart of Morocco. And we're sitting here just having a little bite to eat. We shared a nice chicken pastilla and a nice fresh squeezed banana orange juice. Cost about three bucks, eating in a pretty cool local style bakery. And you know, I was here 40 years ago and kind of fell in love with Marrakesh. And I was wondering if the magic of Marrakesh would survive. And I gotta say, it has. If you want an adventure, Morocco's just a little bit to the south of your European dreams. Happy travels. So that's just a, just a little glimpse of what um, sort of the, the energy on the street. Hey, I want to remind you that in, I don't know, 15 minutes or something, I'll be done talking and uh, we'll have Q&A. And um, uh, right now, Ben and Lucas are behind the scenes answering your questions. But if you've got any questions, Lucas Peters, he's the man. He writes the book on Morocco. He's a colleague of mine, basically, because we both have the same publisher. Um, and uh, I write for Avalon. He writes for Moon, but it's all part of Perseus and part of Hachette. And uh, Lucas's book was just great. And this is the Moon Guidebook to Morocco. And I, I just you know, I just can't imagine going to Morocco without a good guidebook. And um, Lucas is answering your questions right now. So I'm no expert on Morocco. I'm just sharing you my vacation. But Lucas can answer your questions. So if you have questions, put them into the questions now. Lucas will be frantically answering your questions. And then when we're done, we're going to leave the link open for 15 minutes so that you can all browse through the questions. So you don't need to interrupt this, the the slideshow and so on uh, by by reading all the questions, but we'll leave it open for 15 minutes after you're done and you can browse through those questions if you like. Um, but I just, <laughs> uh, it's so fun to have you all with, with me today as I share my uh, holiday and sip my tea. I want to thank our Monday Night Travel crew. We've got Lisa, we've got Gabe, we've got Ben, and we've got all of your support. Every Monday we come to you sharing our love of travel and I look forward to dropping in every month or two to get you up to date on what I'm up to. We've got lots going on. We've had a beautiful year of traveling this year, and we've got lots to look forward to next year. So thanks for traveling with us. Now, we'll continue with our look at Marrakesh. I got to say, coming into Marrakesh, I had to sing my uh, favorite Crosby, Stills, Nash song, Marrakesh Express. And uh, local people don't even know that song. I'm surprised. Because <laughs> any boomer coming into Marrakesh has got to sing that song. Okay, when you get to Marrakesh, you've got these wonderful guys selling juice. I just am a sucker for fruit juice. And here you got is uh, it's dirt cheap and it's really, really good. Plenty of tourist-oriented little eateries and stops. Uh, and uh, a few major uh, sightseeing attractions. Not a lot, frankly, but you've got some important sights to see other than just wandering around. Uh, uh, quite a long line uh, when you go into the few major sites. And here we have some 500-year-old tombs from the, I think it was called the Sadian dynasty, but one of the royal families. And you just feel the history there. 500 years ago, uh, these, these royals were buried right here in this beautiful building. My favorite site in Marrakesh, as far as turnstile sites, was the um, Historical Photograph Museum, our Photography Museum. And here you've got just room after room of, of photographs that take you back to the old days uh, of Morocco and Marrakesh. And uh, it helps bring the, 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 the country to life. Um, wandering around, uh, there's just everywhere you look, there's uh, delights and beautiful little moments. The neighborhood bakery where people bring their bread and uh, this man will bake it for you or your pastries or whatever you're cooking. He has the best stove in the neighborhood and for a few pennies, he'll cook up whatever you got. This artisan is busy um, uh, cutting away uh, beautiful designs. Uh, this man is busy weaving beautiful, beautiful uh, fabrics. Uh, this was a place where we bought a number of gifts from this man. It's nice to know uh, the artisan who makes or weaves 
whatever you're buying to take home. But Shelly and I waited till the last day of our trip and we just dedicated a day to shopping. Uh, I find that the, say, the stuff you might want to buy, it's all over the country. It's pretty much the same, all a good price. And uh, we decided not to burden ourselves with shopping until the very end. And we had an idea of what we wanted to get and we got it in Marrakesh. Mmm, lots of sweets, lots of honey, lots of gorgeous, gorgeous streets to explore, lots of cats. Mohammed liked cats more than dogs, I understand. So you got a lot of cats in Islam. You still got the, uh, the leather tannery there, so you've got that big, uh, wonderful, stinky, vibrant place where they soften the clean the leather, soften the leather, and then dye the leather. And you can drop in and see that. And you'll always be given a little bit of sprig of mint to, to disguise the smell. And you'll have aggressive guides trying to show you around. You got to remember, we are filthy rich compared to the people you meet on the streets in Morocco, most of them. And uh, it's no wonder they, you know, they think, oh, for, you know, we'll give a $5 or a $10 tip. That's a day's wages. And we'll just do it to get on their camel. And if somebody shows you around and they, they, they sort of hijack you from your shopping and they take you to the leather tannery. They're doing it not because they just like you. They're doing it because that's their job and they will then angle for a tip. You got to be pretty strong or you're going to have people, you know, begging for tips all the time. One great thing about having a guide is other guides leave you alone. And you know what you're looking at. Here's the river that goes through the city and not surprisingly, it's empty. This is a, uh, this is a, a, a clip that I filmed that just shows you this whole idea about the derb, the dead end. And I'm, on, I'm starting the clip on the main thoroughfare, and that's what you navigate by. Okay, I'm on this thoroughfare, I know. Then you got to remember which little arch you go through to get into your neighborhood, that cul-de-sac. And deep into that neighborhood is a fancy door, and there is your riad. And it looks like just a frankly, kind of a dumpy neighborhood, uh, well, a, a humble neighborhood that's been really cleaned. And uh, you get to the very end, you open that door and you've got this palatial interior, reminding us that the domestic quarters were simple and fortified on the outside and you step inside and that's the world. That's the world where um, people are free to live their lives the way they want to. Women may be covered in the streets in a very conservative Muslim society, but at home, the women wear the pants and they, they, they rule the home and they are uh, not uh, covered up as if you would find them on the streets. Okay, so here is just a look at the Derb and also at our Riyadh in the city of Marrakesh. Hey, I'm Rick Steves. I'm in the Medina of Marrakesh in Morocco. And this is deep in the old town of Morocco and it's a, it's a labyrinthine kind of shopping zone. And you've got these dead ends. They're like um, cul-de-sacs and they're called a, I think it's a derb. And this is my derb and it's noisy and crowded and motorcycles outside. But you step into your derb and uh, it's kind of like goodbye to the busy world. And then you're in your little wonderland and this is your neighborhood. And throughout Morocco, when you find these medinas, these market cities, they always have a busy uh, main street, and then they've got these cul-de-sacs. And this is the neighborhood. It's confusing at first, but after a while, you get to know it. And you think, ah, this is where I live. And uh, you get to saddle in, and you can peek into people's homes. Say hi to the kids, merhaba. And uh, you've got cats, and you've got the neighborhood, and you've probably got, you know, short-term rentals. And you've got the peace and quiet of maybe 100,000 people living in this 10-mile-long medieval wall of a fortified town. And uh, it could be seen as dirty but it's actually quite clean and comfortable once you get to know it. And here we have our Riyadh, buried deep in the city in a Riyadh. Historically, the houses have looked inward. So this is my Riyadh Siwan, and it's been my home for several days. And we'll see if anybody's home. And a Riyadh is a mansion. 
And here we go. Ah, Shukran. And uh, this is where you live. And this is the equivalent of your hotel. And a Riyadh, by definition, has a courtyard, a beautiful, tranquil, peaceful courtyard, usually around a little fountain with some flowers in the shade of the palm trees. And it's an evocative, tranquil oasis. And that's what we call home. If you want to splurge and have a nice place to sleep, you'll enjoy a Riyadh. Happy travels from Morocco. Ah, there's a beautiful, beautiful oasis to call home. And a five minute walk from there, you're on the square. This is Jama El Fana. And uh, throughout history, this has been where the people from the mountains that come in, the Berber tribes people and so on, come in, they do their market chores, and then they party on the square. They share information on the square. Uh, that's where they all come together. The uh, snake charmers are there, the storytellers are there, the musicians are there, the, the circus is there. And uh, it's there to this day. Today, it's really catering a lot to the, to the interest of tourists, but you got a lot of locals there. And there's, as you can see, all sorts of stalls. This is from the rooftop of a restaurant. Rooftop restaurants are really popular in these cities and you get that perch to watch the action. This is a historic photograph from that museum I mentioned. And you can see it was a meeting place way back when, and it's a meeting place today. I just love this square. And we would go there all different times of day. Quite nice. We had our favorite little restaurant. We had, uh, we loved to get our, our fruit juice and we had our nut boy. I uh, hear this guy loves to just sell nuts and he'll give you samples till the cows come home and you can make a little mix and it costs you a couple of dollars. <laughs> and you're in, you're in nut heaven, I'll tell you. Uh, if you like uh, uh, nipples all over, Lucas taught me this trick of just going around and getting a sampling of olives or nuts or whatever when you're in a market spot like that. And it's a lot of fun. Shelley learned a very important lesson. Don't get eye contact with a henna lady unless you want to have yourself hennaed. And don't let her just try a little bit because she'll go all the way up your arm before you're done. And you haven't even said yes yet. And then she, you give her uh, a couple of dollars. She goes, no, that's $25. Well, that's just a big racket. And they make their living by um, grabbing the arms of uh, unwitting tourists and um, inking them up. So if you want henna, henna, you can get it, but if you don't want it, you're gonna get it anyways, unless you're really good at keeping those henna ladies at bay. Uh, you wash that off and you've got this uh, henna on your hand for uh, at least a couple of days. Lots of music, lots of commotion, lots of different ways to try to win a, a little money uh, and uh, lots of things to look at with your mint tea. Shelly's got some mint tea. I got my mint tea right here. I miss not having all those beautiful tea leaves in my tea, or the mint leaves in my tea. All right, well, we had a, a lot of good food. We had a lot of great guides. I love to just get in a taxi with my guide and let him talk about what we're doing. And we went into the French Quarter, the modern quarter, the European quarter. And remember, as I mentioned earlier, you could spend your time in a city here that, that looks like Europe, or you could spend your time in the Medina, which looks like medieval Arabia. And it's just, you know, half a mile apart. Uh, I would not want to stay in a hotel in this part of town, unless I was a businessman, but if I'm a tourist, I want to stay where the action is. But this is the modern part of Marrakesh. Uh, good old fashioned coffee shops and tea houses. Um, uh, the only church in town, very little Christian culture in this country, uh, big Jewish heritage. And of course, 99% of the population would be Muslim and a beautiful garden. It's called the Marjorie Garden. And it uh, was made in 1931 by the famous painter Marjorie, and it was uh, renovated by Yves Saint Laurent. And today it's one of the most popular sites in town. It's about 12 acres. It's just a beautiful garden there in the modern part of Marrakesh. Our guide took us there and we had a delightful visit. I want to remind you just a year ago, September 8th, well, not a year ago, just a, what, a couple of months ago, September 8th, it was the tragic earthquake and it was very near Marrakesh. It was up in the mountains, uh, just to the south of Marrakesh and um, outside of Marrakesh a couple hours. And uh, I didn't realize how much Marrakesh had been hit by the earthquake. A big minaret was halfway knocked down 
And they, they're worried about their tourism. They want everybody to think it's a ruin because of the earthquake. So they covered up with scaffolding, uh, but they've got to rebuild that thing. Uh, you find, here's a, a round arch that, that is no longer structurally sound. So they had to fortify it. Uh, uh, and all over the place, you find broken buildings. And if a building is damaged and structurally unsafe, it's totaled, even though it looks like it's still standing and they tear it down and they cart it away. Uh, this uh, was a photograph I took just uh, 10 days ago. And um, tragically, you see little, you know, um, tractors that can drive down these, uh, our little dump trucks and tractors that can drive down these lanes, carting away the rubble of what used to be somebody's home. It's heartbreaking when you see, there's that tractor I'm talking about. And um, the earthquake um, uh, it's quite expensive to repair and, and a lot of people died in the earthquake. Uh, we drove into the mountains from Marrakesh toward the national park called Tubkal, and uh, we saw, uh, you know, two lane roads that were now one lane as they had to uh, uh, clear out the avalanches caused by the earthquake. And we saw the blue tents of refugees created by the earthquake and towns that were hit hard by the earthquake. Um, it just reminds you of the humanity. Of a, of a natural disaster like this, and they're happening all over the world, impoverishing people and stoking hunger. Which is a nice transition for me to announce that we are starting our, I think, sixth or seventh or eighth annual uh, Christmas fundraiser for Bread for the World. Every year we raise a million dollars for Bread for the World by talking 5,000 people into giving $100, and I match it. If 5,000 people can give $100 to Bread for the World, I will give $500,000 to Bread for the World, the same as the total of all those people. Together, we'll empower the work of Bread for the World by a million dollars. I've supported Bread for the World ever since I was a student. Uh, I've, been, I've been helping them out for 30 or 40 years because I believe the most smart and effective way to leverage my philanthropic energy is to support an advocacy organization. Bread for the World works in Washington, D.C. to help our government do the right thing when it comes to the needs of hungry people. This is a battle that needs to be fought, and if you care about hunger, we need to have somebody at the table who speaks up for the hungry, because hungry people don't have lobbyists, except for Bread for the World. Bread for the World is empowered by our support and we supply a lot of energy to Bread for the World because we understand it's a great charity. It's a great, it's not a charity, it's a service. I care about hunger, you care about hunger. I want my government to represent me when it comes to what we can do and when we're so rich to be able to, and privileged and blessed to be able to travel like we do, to do a little bit to help people who will never see their name on a plane ticket. So here's the deal. If you can give $100 or more, you can use the uh, QR code there. You can just go to bread.org. Um, but you get a gift. You get our three Christmas gift, uh, three pack, three gift pack uh, for Christmas, which is my uh, Christmas special that we did on public television on DVD, plus an amazing DVD, a CD of all my favorite Christmas uh, music from our European shoot. It's my favorite uh, 20 uh, Christmas carols because it's fresh and it's different from what we always hear in the United States. And you get the book about Christmas that I wrote over the course of producing our Christmas special. It's a wonderful three gift package. And that's yours totally for free. And you can also, if you don't want that, or if you've already got that, you can get our new art series on DVD, all six hours of the story of European art that we just produced the last two years, plus the Rick Steves planning map. And that would be free. I'm donating all of those, including the shipping, so that if you can spend uh, our support bread for the world of the $100, they'll get every penny of that $100 doubled because I'll put in another $100. You can see I'm excited about this. It's the first time I've talked about this this year. If you want to make something special for this Christmas or this holiday, here's your chance to do a great thing. All right, learn more about that if you care. Thank you very much. Now, when we are traveling in Morocco, what you want to do is find a weekly market, a weekly market. We had to drive about 45 minutes to find this weekly market because they rotate from day to day to town to town. And it was well worth it. It was so fun to go to this market. Here's just a little minute walk through the market. Hey, I'm Rick Steves. I'm in a little town. I don't know the name. I don't think anybody knows the name of it who doesn't live in this country. This is in Morocco, about an hour away from Marrakesh. But this is a weekly market. 
and the market is going to small town to small town. And uh, we just walked through this place and honestly there's not a, anybody that looks remotely like a tourist in the whole place. But the weekly market is a chance for you to connect with the local culture. And if you happen to be in the market for some nice chickens, some you got exactly what you need here. So, I just love this. So when you're in Morocco, make sure you make time to find a village which is having their weekly market and then make the scene. Wow. Can you imagine just exploring your way through this market? I mean, you'll find this guy who's being, <laughs> it looks like swap day. And now the, the goats are, are, are riding the, the, uh, the shepherds or the goat herds. Uh, uh, you'll find all sorts of livestock. You'll find boxes of fluffy ducks. You'll find uh, tagines. You'll have all sorts of happy people doing their cooking. Uh, it's just a wonderland. And this is a totally untouristy thing. As I mentioned, there's not a tourist anywhere to be found. You got the local fiddler and then you're on your way to the national park to take a hike. Uh, we really wanted to do a hike in the mountains, so we went up to this. It's the Tub Kal National Park, just a couple hours drive from Marrakesh, and it was delightful to be hiking from town to town in this oasis area, uh, this lush river valley, to see how they did their irrigation, to meet the people, and to just get in the countryside. And I am enchanted by the call to prayer. A lot of people are kind of creeped out by the call to prayer, but they don't know what the call to prayer is. It's a beautiful, beautiful way to praise God. And it sweeps across the globe from Malaysia to Morocco with the speed of the turning earth five times a day, like a global ray wave of praise, like in a, in a stadium when you do this. And I just think it's a beautiful moment. But here we are in a very remote corner of Morocco, in a very remote corner of Islam, and we'll take 30 seconds just to hear the call to prayer. I find it so interesting how every community has their, the, the person who sings the call to prayer and some are almost embarrassed by the person's voice and others love that one's voice. They feel so fortunate to have uh, a, a beautiful call to prayer. Um, I don't have an ear for it, so I don't know what's a good one or a bad one. But I do know that um, a lot of people find it uh, threatening, but it's, to me, if you're a monotheist, if you believe in one God, that's just a declaration that there is one, one God, and that means there's one deity, and it is God. Uh, there's one God, and he is Allah. And Allah is just the Arabic way of saying God. And what they're talking about is there's one God with a small g, like if there's a lot of gods, the gods. There's just one, and he is God with a capital G. And that is, uh, that's sort of the essence of what monotheism is all about. And there's a billion people across this planet who will interrupt their daily chores five times to take a moment and remember that we have a creator. When we reached the end of our hike or the high point of our hike, we met a wonderful family. And uh, our, our friend here was explaining to us in the Berber people, they like to have three fingers up. And that means uh, the land, the people and the language. And the Berbers are so strong with their culture. It's a beautiful thing. And we got to have a beautiful meal there and learn about their traditions and learn about, oop, I gotta have another sip of tea. We had to learn about their tea ceremony. They make a big deal about the tea, I'll tell you that. And then we got to hike to the end of the trail and there's a very refreshing corner with a big waterfall. And that was a lot of fun, sort of the, the climax of our, of our time in the national park. Driving home, you know, we just stopped at a rest stop, had a cup of tea, have some coffee, have some bottled water, 
and kind of marvel at the experience we're sharing. Of course, on the TV was the latest news from Israel and Gaza. And uh, it's interesting to think that um, everybody's tuning in and heartbroken by this tragedy. And it was, um, there's no reason not to travel when things are going haywire in the news. Generally, I mean, you don't want anything reckless, but you know, there's a war going on in Ukraine, there's an earthquake in Morocco, there's a tragedy in the Holy Land. I'm happy and thankful to be on the road, to be able to talk to people in other societies, with other outlooks, with other media, with other religions, with other points of view, with other life stories, and get their take on what's going on. It really helps me, rather than being here with my choice of media, with my tribe. I like to get out of my comfort zone. A lot of people are afraid of culture shock. Culture shock, and you've seen just a little bit of it in this last hour, is a good thing. It's a constructive thing. I see culture shock as the growing pains of a broadening perspective. And I like to have my culture shock curated by a good guide. That's what we do when we take people to Europe. We curate the culture shock so people have a broadening experience and they go home with that most beautiful souvenir, a better understanding of the other 96% of humanity. And that's what I enjoyed with our tour in Morocco. Back in Marrakesh, we settled back into our Riyadh. I mentioned there's a lot of roof gardens. That's the roof garden of our, it's like a resort in the middle of this labyrinthine medieval Medina. And we spent some very nice time eating and sunbathing up on top of that roof. And uh, the rooms were about like that, quite nice. And then one of the last things we did, we went to the Amal Women's Training Center. And this is where women are learning to be chefs and cooks and find a good job in that industry. And they were teaching us, like they were teaching each other, how to make a good tangine. And man, this was a cool experience. A lot of focus on herbs and spices. And that's the, you know, anything cooked in one of those beautiful pottery um, uh, pots is, it can be a tangine. It just depends on what you put in there. And we would actually go out into the garden and, and pick our own herbs. And we ate it and it was tasty. Man, it was good. I've had the beautiful experience of going to cooking classes and making and cooking my, actually cooking classic dishes from different cultures this year. And you know, if you got a good coach and you don't try to be too fancy, what you cook is darn tasty. And in the case of Morocco, it comes with tea and sugar and mint. Back in town, our last night, well, our last night together uh, was spent on a food tour, going to all sorts of interesting places and eating all sorts of interesting things. How safe was that for our digestive systems? I don't know. If you're being careful, I wouldn't go on this. But we were at the end of our tour and we just had a great time with that. Um, I want to, all around, I saw, you know, groups with guides. And uh, we were just real thankful to have the tour that uh, my friend Lucas and his wonderful partner and wife, Amina, put together. And Lucas and Amina joined us for our last dinner in Morocco. And there we see Luca and Amina. Amina is uh, uh, his uh, wife and business partner. He met her in, in uh, Tangier, up in the north of Morocco. Um, you know, the, the, the streets are just cluttered and busy and chaotic, but every night they're just empty and they're left with garbage and all sorts of just stuff that needs to be cleaned up. And every night they are cleaned up. Look at this is the chaotic street every night. And we walked home at midnight on that last night. And I was really thankful to get that other look at the, the Medina and the souks and the shopping quarters and all that craziness. And it was just another memory from a great time as we went early the next morning, very early to the uh, impressive airport in uh, Marrakech, and we called it a vacation. So that's what we did on our 2023 vacation. I hope you found it interesting. And um, I'm just uh, happy to be able to add that to my uh, lifetime of travel memories. And uh, Lisa, I think we're ready for some questions. We are ready for some questions, um, but before we get to them, may we have a word from our sponsor, please? Oh, thank you. Well, our sponsor is the company you and I both work for. It's called Rick Steves Europe, and it's 100 hardworking, passionate, mission-driven travelers who love exploring our beat, and our beat is Europe, taking careful notes, 
making all sorts of mistakes and learning from those mistakes, coming the home with that information and packaging it in a way that others can learn from our experience rather than their own and travel smoother, enjoying maximum travel thrills for every mile, minute, and dollar on their precious vacation. Right, Lisa? Absolutely. Mile, minute, and dollar. You got it. And uh, right now we're celebrating all the stuff that we offer people in our web store and in our little shop here in Edmonds uh, by putting everything 20% off. So if you want to get a bag, the bag that I live out of, my 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 joy, my delight, I, you know how I love my carrying the airplane size convertible suitcase rucksack. It is discounted 20% and that means it's $80. And uh, I, if I could spend $400 to get a better bag, I would. But this bag I've designed, and for my purposes, it works great. And um, if you want the wheelie version of it, it costs a little more money, but it's also 20% off, and it's a steal. It's a, it's a screaming deal also. And uh, we take 30,000 people on our tours every year. Nobody is allowed to start the tour with any more than this size of a bag, 9 by 22 by 14 inches. That's what you can carry in the airplane. That's tough love, baby. You're going to pack light, and you're going to be thankful you do. And when you have a bag that is the right size, you got your parameters already set in advance and you'll be uh, you'll be mobile and that's a good thing so that would be um i'd say uh this this uh monday night travel is brought to you by ricksteves.com you go there you've got all sorts of information and you've got good deals on guidebooks and luggage and our tour program thank you very much now we can have some questions may i add one thing sure and free shipping until my daughter's birthday, December 10th. Thank you. May I add one thing? I think you got to spend $50 to get that free shipping. <laughs> so there, there go. we go. So 20% off, free shipping, if you go $50 or more until December 10th. And you'll have some great gifts for the traveler on your gift list under the tree. Nice. So, but do we have some questions there, Lisa? We do. Kathy says, Rick, you look so well rested. What's your secret to not overdoing it while traveling? Well, the secret is for me, because uh, I'm not well rested, I've never been working harder and I'm quite exhausted right now, but I'm just really happy because we've been traveling and um, it suits me. I've found my niche. I think the trick is finding a career where you can be mission driven, finding where you're meant to be. I'm really thankful for a lot of things. And as the owner of a company that employs 100 people, I'm so thankful I've got mission driven uh, staff and employees and workmates. We all care about um, people's travels. We all recognize the value of people's travels. And we love to make our living a good living by helping people have better trips. And we do that because we have a lot of travel experience between between us. So uh, it's just, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm just in a, I don't know why, probably because I just had a vacation. That must be it. I went on vacation with Shelly for two weeks. <laughs> Okay, uh, Grant wants to know, during your free time on your tour, when you were not with your guide, how difficult was it to communicate with people? It never even occurred to me that there was a language barrier. Now, a lot of, I'm just, it is an interesting question because a lot of people couldn't speak English, but I didn't need them to speak English. I was on that, you know, when I went on the little goofy car with Shelly around that square, nobody there spoke English as far as I know. Morocco is a strange country because the first language is, I think, Arabic, and then Berber, and then French, and then maybe Spanish, and then English. Now, just the last few years, they've decided, hey, it would be better if our kids learned English instead of French to be global business people. So they're replacing French with English as the, the European language. But you can see the fun I had there on that square. I didn't need to speak the language. So it wasn't that I could communicate with everybody, but there's so much fun to be having in Morocco. There's, it works. But when it comes to your hotel, you know, your your um, restaurant, your shopping, people speak English uh, enough to sell you something. I think people don't know how good a pantomimer you are with your mm -hmm. years of travel experience and not, you know, not always speaking the language you learn to do things and you're really, really good at it. Yeah, that's, I, I mean, you do learn just out of necessity, but you also always want to know a few words. I'm, I'm pathetic with languages, uh, but I'm really good at smiling and knowing how to say please and thank you and hello. And, you know, uh, I've got my favorite words in, in every language. Merhaba. I said merhaba to the little kid in the street and he said merhaba back. Shukran. 
you know, sugar on. I just remember it's sugar on, you know, sugar on. I mean, there's sugar on my mint leaves. Sugar, sugar on is thank you. Okay. Um, inshallah. I like inshallah. It just means God willing. And um, we say God willing. And in the Arab world, they say inshallah. They say it a lot. Uh, if you are a tourist in the Arab world and you say inshallah, they think you're cool. Speaking of uh, traveling in Muslim words, worlds, um, John had a question. How does the his your your best of Turkey tour, but Turkey traveling in Turkey compare to Morocco? I like Turkey better. I'll tell you, I've been to Turkey 20 times. I love Morocco, but Turkey to me has history I can grasp. It's got cuisine I can relate more to, and it's safer from your belly's point of view. Um, that's just my opinion. Uh, there's something about Turkey I just love. It's designed for sightseeing, easy transportation, great people, and it's in a part of the world that intersects. Turkey is at a crossroads more than Morocco. Um, I'm sure Lucas would, would uh, have a different opinion about that. And I totally respect that. Uh, but I had the time of my life in Morocco. But, um, um, and I'm glad Lucas does tours in Morocco. Uh, but we do our tours in Turkey. And I just love Turkey. I liked being a woman in Turkey better than Morocco. But I would disagree with you on the food. I think Moroccan mm -hmm. food is. Yeah. I think Morocco food is, is rated higher. I, I noticed I did some reading about the best cuisines in the world and Morocco is right up in there in the top 10. All right. Gabe, whom you know quite well, asks, what aspects of travel in Morocco are most similar to Europe and what was the most different you discovered? Well, what's different is the whole Arabic orientation. Um, in fact, huh, let me just, uh, uh, there's two slides here that I wasn't going to show, huh, but I'll show them to you because it's a different orientation. We know Marco Polo, you know, because he went to China and so on. At the same time, there's a guy named Ibn Battuta, right? This guy, he is the Arabic Marco Polo and Arabic people don't know Marco Polo. And uh, Europeans don't know Ibn Battuta. But I, I was sitting in a cafe a few years ago in uh, Romania, just waiting for my film crew to do their work. And I was just sitting there having a coffee. And ha, I was just gazing at the wallpaper. And here's the thing about Ibn Battuta. And it says, he was the Rick Steves of his days roaming the world to tell everyone what they were missing. Only he did it 700 years ago, risking his life almost every step of the way in an age when visiting the next village made you a world traveler. Ha! And I just thought, whoa, what a ridiculous statement to call Ibn Battuta the Rick Steves of his day, but I'll take it. <laughs> You're pulling my leg. You photoshopped that. No, that's real. That is real. It was on a, it was a printed in one of those kind of wallpaper things. <laughs> I don't believe it. That's crazy. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, a big compliment. But I mean, to, to answer the rest of that was Gabe's question, I, Gabe's question. Um, Morocco is Arabic. It's Muslim. It's cheap. It's exotic. It's confusing. It's I love culture shock and I get it by going beyond Europe. When I was a kid, I taught an all day class about Europe every Saturday, six hours. And then after dinner, I would teach a three hour class called TBE, Travel Beyond Europe. And it was Egypt, Morocco, and Turkey. Because when you go to Europe and you wanna spice things up, you're just an hour's flight or an hour boat ride away from something that makes more change culturally than flying all the way from Seattle to Europe. I always like to say, when you go to Morocco, that one little boat ride from southern Spain, Gibraltar and Tarifa over to Tangier, that boat ride makes more cultural change than flying all the way from the United States to Spain, you see. So if you're looking for cultural change, if you got 10 days in Spain and you wonder what to do on day 11, go to Morocco. That'd be the most exciting thing you could do. 
Okay, two more questions. Um, I just want to honor all the women who are in the audience. And I know that you cannot tell me what it was like to travel as a woman in Morocco, but did Shelly or Valerie say how they felt? That's a good question. And both um, Valerie and um, Shelly would be very tuned in to a woman's respect and role and so on. You're in a Muslim world where there's a different, just a different tenor of society. And I'm not going to say it's good or bad or men are abusive or women are downtrodden or anything like that. It's different. And I, as I did allude to, in the street, it's kind of a man's world. And in the home, it's more of the woman's world. Um, but it's a complicated thing. Uh, but who am I to um, uh, comment on that as a, as a, as a, a male? But I never heard Val or Shelley express that they were um, upset with things uh, as far as they were being treated. Of course, they could look at society just like you could here and say it's not, it's not fair for women. Uh, but I never heard them uh, upset about how they were treated. Um, people were quite gracious. And, uh, you know, it's, you go in some area and you, find, you go to a tea shop and it's all men except for a couple of tourist women. And that's just kind of the way it is there. Uh, but you go to another quarter and it's the women are there. So I don't know. It's, it's, uh, I always think different societies are in parallel tracks. And we've had our revolution. We've had our Vatican, what is it called? Vatican II. Is that what it's called? Vatican II. Uh, we've had our reformation. We've had, we've, we've moved. We've had, we've had our civil rights thing. We've had our women's suffrage, right? And 100 years ago, we didn't have that. And other societies are moving forward too, but they're in different places on that evolutionary track. I think Scandinavians are ahead of us. And I think we're ahead of a lot of people. And it's a struggle. And sometimes we fall back and sometimes we go forward. But we got to give people some patience and we got to realize we're all progressing. And we got to realize we're not all equally fortunate or blessed in how far along that line we've come. But we're going in the right direction. And that's good news. Okay, last question. Speaking of blessings, there were a few people in the Q&A who wanted to know if it was Jackie's time in Morocco that made them name your grandson Atlas. <laughs> ah, that's very interesting. Um, I don't know, but Jackie, uh, we took her to Europe every year, uh, but she had a Moroccan teacher at her high school that was uh, well-known and beloved for taking his students to his hometown in the mountains of Morocco. And that was just... 15 years ago. Um, and uh, I don't know if people would do that today, but it was the greatest educational experience for those kids to stay with a family in the, in the hill, in a village in Morocco, like those village I just showed you. And what really struck Jackie was the, um, the role of women in that society. And uh, it was astonishing to her that the, you know, she, she couldn't play soccer with the boys because soccer was something the boys do. And, and the girls were doing this, you know, and all of that. So she got a great dose of that. A lot of things she just loved and a lot of things that very frustrated her, but she came home with an appreciation that this world is full of different values and different people and different societies and different faiths. Um, that was a long time ago, but it, it inspired her to be the teacher she is today. She's, a, a, she's one of those dead poet societies teachers that everybody should want when they got English classes in high school, you know. Uh, and it was part because of uh, the exposure from her Moroccan teacher that took her to Morocco when she was in that formative age. Uh, their little baby is named Atlas. <laughs> He's one years old now. My grandson, my only grandson, Atlas. What a name. And we're up in the Atlas Mountains. So I don't know. That's a good question. I bet it had something to do with it. Is that the last question? That was the last question. I've had so much fun. I think I'm just amped up from this tea with the, with the sugar and the mint in it. But I want to thank everybody for joining us. And of course, Lisa, thank you for all the work you do with your colleagues. Uh, and we'll have this show archived with all 100 plus shows we've done over the last couple of years at ricksteves.com. So thank you for joining us. Happy travels and uh, merhaba. Good night, Lisa. Good night, Rick.